Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop my video and go mute but I'll listen to you. Cool. Okay, cool. awesome. Bye. So yeah, I'm just gonna um, speak about the nature of the disease from my perspective and from my understanding, and then when you have questions or you wanna chime in with your um, you know ideas or whatever it is or or challenge me on some of that um, on some of the points you know feel free so the nature of the disease from my understanding and experience you know there's there's two sides on one hand there is the physical side which is very much reliant on you know what do we put in our body how toxically burdened is our body and um, and obviously that comes from environmental toxins, which are, as we all know, very uh, predominant in, in our lifestyle today, certainly more than they ever were. Uh, and that's why when people say, oh, but, you know, we have adapted to eating this way, it's like, sure. Or the other day we had this whole discussion around, around meat eating and, you know, people saying, oh, but Jesus was giving fish, which you know, is it a metaphor or not, but never mind. The point is during Jesus's times, the fish was nowhere near as polluted as it is sadly today. And so it goes with everything. You know, we do live uh, without over dramatizing it. We do live in an extremely toxic world. And yes, as much as man has adapted and we have this incredible ability or our bodies have this incredible ability to adapt and to make a plan and to still function, it does not mean that we are functioning at optimum. And so that's, that's where we need to come in and say, well, how can we, what can we do to the body to allow it to operate at, at, at optimum level? And so environmental toxins play a number one role. The other thing is that most of us, unless we've grown up in a totally pristine environment from totally pristine parents, which is kind of highly unlikely, then most of us are already born with a degree of toxicity, some more than others. Um, for example, I was born to a mother that had amalgams in her teeth before I was born, before I was conceived. And so my bones, my whole physical body grew with mercury toxicity leaking into my growing bones from conception. So I was born already with mercury toxicity. And even though I only discovered that much later because I didn't think that I would have mercury toxicity, I don't have amalgams and I didn't think I was exposed to mercury Meanwhile, I had high mercury in my body and, you know, we backtracked it to, it must have come from my mother. And, you know, so there's a lot of things that we're simply born with. And then obviously there's the accumulated toxicity through wrongful eating. And wrongful eating simply because we didn't know any better. I didn't know that eating animal products was, and certainly dairy, was accumulating toxicity and mucus in my body. So once we start understanding where this toxic load comes from and all the different sides, then we quickly start getting uh, an idea of actually how severe the impact on our bodies um, is. And then, and that's just the physical side, which you know, as we dismantle, as we start stripping away the physical toxicity through cellular detoxification that can and we will be rectified. And yes, it takes time because as we are all seeing, you know, it's not enough to kind of go all in for two or three months, which was my initial thinking, but that it takes, it takes years simply because it's, it's an organic and natural process. And just as it took years to build up toxicity in our body and that there was DNA that has been mutated because of toxicity. And that's where people, you know, when people say, oh, but I have, you know, genetic mutations and that's why I can't detox. It's like, sure, but that doesn't mean that you can't detox. It just means that it's going to take longer and that we have to go slower and we have to target different organs in a specific way so that you can progressively detox. So nothing in your DNA is ever written in stone. 
you know, our DNA is just a blueprint. And it means that because of certain exposure, because of certain imprint, then the blueprint changes and shifts. But if those things that have impacted the, the DNA get taken away, and if we now impact the DNA in a positive way, our DNA can actually change. But it's just realizing that that imprint will take time to be taken away. And so that's the physical side of toxicity. But another big part of, or, or of disease, but the other big part of disease is the whole emotional and mental and spiritual side of it. And mainly I would say the spiritual and emotional part because the mind simply follows the physical. And we know that because when we change our way of eating, especially at the beginning in what I call the honeymoon period, as we start eating lighter foods, as we take away the mucus forming food, as we take away the, the, the toxic load food and we eat fruit and vegetables, we very quickly, sometimes within a matter of days, the fog sort of lifts and we start feeling amazing and energized. And that alone tells us that the, the mind follows the body because when the body feels light and good, all of a sudden our thoughts change, the way that we see the world change, even the colors change because people all the time tell me, wow, Alex, all of a sudden now I see colors, you know, they look so much more brighter. And it's like, yes, because as your body cleans, there isn't that film anymore. And, and that all translates into the mind and into the way that we see the world. And then therefore the way that we feel towards ourselves and therefore towards the world, because everything is always a reflective relationship. So we know that the mind follows the body, but more importantly is that consciousness, our spirit, if we will, follows the body as well. And so a lot of the dark thoughts, the depression, the bipolar symptoms, the sort of, you know, feeling very fra fragmented in our lives starts coming together as our body comes together and starts working in unison. And on the other hand, we need to understand that every single disease also comes as a huge teaching and each disease comes with its own set of teaching that is perfectly aligned for our highest growth and, and for our highest evolution. And the way that I have come to that is, you know, through my own experience of disease and having experienced different kinds of disease through, throughout my, I'm 44 now. And so through, you know, probably from the age of sort of seven where, you know, but there I wasn't really aware. So, I mean, you know, if we speak from when did I start becoming aware that there was a link between dis-ease and consciousness and my spiritual evolution, certainly in my twenties, when I had my first bout of um, really deep depression and, and kind of at some point um, psychotic uh, episodes and, and then realizing, wow, that was, yes, on one hand, we can go and, and label that purely from a clinical perspective and go, it's just depression or psychosis or, which is what I did, I realized it was a spiritual awakening. It was a, a, a such a dramatic paradigm shift of my reality that it looked like initially um, like depression and psychosis. Meanwhile, it was such a radical shift because there was a spiritual evolution happening. And that spiritual evolution, which for a while looked like dis-ease, was what grew me. And without that moment of dis-ease, I would not have been able to grow. Had I just been you know, floating in full balance, nothing would have moved me to grow and to seek growth and to seek change. And the same thing is what I see in, in cancer patients, you know, if we want to go to the more 
or what most people consider sort of, you know, severe diagnosis. Cancer is what we, what we look at as a severe diagnosis. And yet every single cancer patient that I've worked with or chronic disease patient that I've worked with, I see a very distinct pattern emotional pattern that completely mirrors the disease. So for example, um, you know, oftentimes cancer patients do have um, a certain, and of course the, the ramifications or the, the specifics will vary, you know, so it's not like a standard cookie cutter picture, but they are, they are kind of red threads that run through cancer patients, thyroid disease patients. So actually let's talk about thyroid disease patients because, you know, I had thyroid disease and that's where I, I see in all the women that struggle with, th with thyroid disease, they struggle with communicating their truth and standing in their truth and owning their truth. And that is where so often we can get confused because our truth is not what we would like it to be. It's not what we, what we would imagine ourselves to be, but it's surrendering to that which we are. And that for most people is such a big um, divide because we tend to bypass, to spiritually bypass who we truly are, what is there, what is our true and honest, authentic feeling versus the image that we would like to be, the image that we would like to portray. Sorry, just trying to get out of the sun here. Um, so does, does that make any sense? Am, am, am I making sense to you? Does anybody have any questions so far? Maria says, yes, I had thyroid issues um, when I was not living my truth. Yeah. So I, and that I, I see it across the board, you know, and they are, I mean, almost all women. And if we look at the, the group, you know, the living mucus free group, there's 4,000 people and almost every single woman in the group has some sort of thyroid issue. And that is because most women are not living in the fullness of their truth. They are, we are not speaking our true feelings. And I, even though I've been working with this for, for quite some time now, I still catch myself. And that's why utter awareness and presence is so crucial because I still catch myself in moments just disengaging that little bit from my true feeling, which is here which just is, and wanting to project it into what I would like it to be. So I have this, this image of who I would like to be and then who I think I must be in order to be successful and in order to be accepted and to be loved and, you know, there's all that story. And then I have to be very conscious to bring that back to, to disengage from the image and to just work with this is what is. And I trust that if this is what is, it is perfect. It is perfect for, it's a perfect starting point for me to be lovable, successful, seen, accepted, and all of that. Instead of wanting to bypass that and move towards what I perceive to be perfectly okay to be accepted, loved, etc. Does that make sense that that is, there is a divide there. There's a difference. And that when we disengage from what is true, from what is present, we actually automatically create a state of peace. And then when we perpetually do that, and I see that with all the clients that I work with, that there is a divide between that which I am which is always perfect, no matter how messy and, um, you know, not, not contained or, or, or not nice as it may seem to us. The more that we, the closer that we stay to our truth, 
and we simply own that as perfection because that's the other piece you know we need to own this that we're feeling as perfection and as we speak our truth and as we speak our truth with the conviction that this is not just serving us but it's naturally and automatically serving everybody else that is how we create harmony in our family in our relationships so th is is this making sense I, I would like your feedback because you know it's, it's it's quite a it's quite a thing to to verbalize even for me you know as as i've been feeding into this like, okay formulating this this kind of um thought process philosophy whatever you want to call it it's 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 quite a thing Um, so Maria says, yes, this is huge. It's hard to learn to become comfortable, disappointing people, right? Yeah, well, and it's not even, you see, that's where it's not about disappointing people because in many ways, so, you know, again, I can only ever bring it back to myself and then, you know, you can see how does that relate to you? Like for many years, I deceived, if you will, I deceived my parents by obviously unwillingly, but by pretending that I was going to be a big businesswoman, maybe working on Wall Street, being, you know, rah, rah, rah in, in that world and pretending that I was really engaged in that world of luxury. And I believe my own lies, by the way. So it's not, you know, it's kind of like I, I wasn't even, I was lying to myself more than anybody else invested in living that glamorous glamorous life and and then realizing it was not serving me one bit i was really bad at it i actually didn't give a shit about that world and that what i really longed for was this that i'm doing and and yet i myself had negative perceptions around the me that wanted to be. I had judgments against the me that loved blissing out in yoga. Ooh, let's keep that hush hush because, you know, that might be too hippie. And so I was clipping myself in so many ways because of my own judgment and therefore also, you know, portraying a false self to my, my, my parents in that sense. And then once I couldn't do that anymore and I just had to be who I was because I got sick. And so I had to come to, to make peace with who I really was and to just go, well, even if it, even if this makes me a hippie, even if this makes me, you know, whatever, all these, these images that I had, this is who I am. And I just have to make peace with that and not just make peace with it, but I have to trust that God, Goddess, all that is creation made me this way for a very specific reason and purpose. And that once I surrender and trust in that, then I will start serving not just myself, but everybody else. And that has been my experience. And so, yes, on the one hand, by becoming myself, I have let down some people like my parents and you know, maybe eventually they will recover from this but on the other hand i have and am serving so many other people with us and you know for one certainly my marriage has completely transformed by me becoming who i truly am and my work is transformed and you know exploded and so forth so do you see how because this, it's not about me. It's about making the example that when in who we are, and when we do the work that is necessary to just come more and more and more into ourselves, and when we honor our true wishes, our true desires, our true feelings, and when we simply voice them, not in a way of Meaniness, not in a way of like, oh, well, I am owed um, 
gratification of these desires, but as a simple, I am that I am. And then waiting for the universe to respond to that owning of what we are, that is where the resolution of dis-ease comes in. So Maria says, my family finds me so difficult because of the way I eat. I want to socialize with them. I kind of have my own food. It's that feeling of not being part of the community. Sure. And yet, and yet that's also, it's also part of simply making peace with this is my choice. This is what serves me. And then, you know, and that's why I becoming consciously aware of these patterns, you know, is the constant work. Um, and to realize, well, just eating differently is not what is not really what makes me different. You know, like if, if that is what makes us, what, what gives us communal ground, that would be sad. What gives us communal ground, what makes us relate, what makes us feel part of is communing from the heart. And so what I've learned and I'm still continuously learning on this path is that basically when we take away the numbing comfort of mucus forming foods, all these things that are so nice, you know, so nice to eat. It's so nice to drink a glass of wine, to eat cheese and bread because that just sort of like, it just numbs. And not just in a, in, a, in a metaphysical way, but in a real way, because cheese actually is an opiate, for example. So it, may, it gives us those same feelings. So it really does numb. And I mean, we all know wine, you know, kind of gives you that sort of chilled out feeling. It's sort of, it's just that little bit of nebulization. It doesn't, it takes away the crispness, the pure presence but now when we take away that, when we take away the numbing agents and we are constantly left in pure presence, it becomes much more important to speak our truth and necessary to speak our truth. And then we realize how, just how important it is to be in presence with truth and to continuously be in that space with other people. So it kind of like, it forces us to do that work. And yet as uncomfortable as it is, because even for me still, each new truth that I reveal to somebody, it's like, ah, oh, there is that moment of like, ah, oh. but in a sense, I'm, I've trained myself enough to just go, just keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on breaking open. And with each breaking open, I am met not all the time, but the majority of the time I am met with openness and with love and with expansion. And then on the other hand, when we are not met with openness and expansion, it simply becomes a sign of the universe, of the energies to redirect our energies, right? So instead of then, you know, making the other person wrong or the relationship wrong it's simply like okay where is the invitation of redirecting our energies so in other words nothing is ever right or wrong everything is just always as is when we are in our authenticity and so to bring it back to the nature of disease the nature of disease really shows us and it and it's relating to anything it can even just be you know like let's say people often have lower back pain a lot of people struggle with lower back pain and yes on one hand the physical side of lower back pain is closed kidneys toxic kidneys kidneys that are not filtering weak adrenals potentially even weak disc which is again related to weakness in the tissue, weakness in the bones, weakness, acidity in the cartilage, in, in, in the tissue surrounding the disc, and it's the physical side. But then there's also always an emotional side that goes with it. And oftentimes there is, that's the fear and contraction around life that we carry. And I myself, um, you know, remember just how much fear I used to live with. 
it's now kind of unfathomable to even think back that I lived with so much fear in my body for so many years. It's like, oh my goodness, my poor body, knowing what I know now, it's a miracle that, you know, I wasn't more diseased. But knowing what I know now, it's like, of course I was diseased. Of course my body was diseased. It carried so much fear, so much contraction, so much tension that, you know, it, it, it couldn't do otherwise. But and in other um, emotions that are obviously around lower back pain is, is the feeling of not being supported. And it's, again, so common with a lot of women, but also with a lot of men. And that's where, you know, what I'm seeing is that so many of us, and again, I would say all of us, unless we've done a lot of work on ourselves, we all struggle to really reach out and ask for support. And that's what I, for example, one of the major things that I have learned in my marriage is to actually go and ask for support. And... I was, I was, am blessed to have this man who has always just been there and said, you know, just, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. And initially that was the hardest thing to actually let in for, for probably my first seven years of marriage. I kept sort of looking at him from all sides, you know, quietly and going like, really? Like, can I just completely let go and show my full self, even all my ugly bits, even all my weak parts or the, or the pieces that I perceive as weak. Can I just be all me? Until eventually, you know, sort of like I looked and looked and looked and looked enough to feel safe to just crack open and be the fullness of myself and to initially shatter in a million pieces when I got sick. And then by witnessing, by experiencing the support that I actually received from him and then being able to relax into that and to feel, to have the experience, the physical experience, the emotional experience of being supported and allowing that support without shame, without guilt, without feeling I'm too much and you know all of that that goes with it, by having the experience that healed and that was part of the healing of the kidneys and of the adrenals and you know my whole self so do you see how everything is always connected nothing is ever in isolation and that is what i find so beautiful about this whole system of living mucus free is that it continuously exposes everything that needs attention and instead of us coming to life from a perspective of, oh, when are we done? When am I done with this disease? When can I just go on with life? But to rather take all these little pointers that, that the body brings us, you know, sometimes it's a sore back, then it's a maybe, you know, more severe disease, then it's a little bit of this, it's a little bit of that, it's tiredness. But to take all of these symptoms as amazing gifts, as alarm bells, you know, and that's why I see it's like our temple is ringing little alarm bells all the time and going, please pay attention to this. Please pay attention to that. Are you feeling into this? And instead of going, oh, this is too much. I just want to get on with life. It's like, this is life. Your body is your life, is your temple. And unless you make space for it, and unless you make space to listen to it, the minute that that bell rings, and that is what I feel like I am getting better and better at doing, instead of waiting for the bell to ring like that, I just hear it now. I hear the tiniest ring, not always, but most of the time. And then I go, yes. What do you have to say? And then tending to that immediately and seeing how it ripples out into my life. So often, you know, even in business, I tend to my body because that's my priority always. It's my temple. 
And then as I tend to my body, new openings come into business. And people go like, but how is that possible? Well, because everything is one. Everything is connected. Does that make sense? Let me just read, trying to get out of the sun. Um, yeah, letting, letting in support is huge. Absolutely. To receive is my 2018 intention. Beautiful. It is so big. It is so big. And, you know, I'm kind of hoping that um, my mom doesn't listen to this because what I'm saying here is, you know, I feel like mm, my mother so often feels, you know, like it's so it's and, and a lot of people do this. You know, we feel it's so yucky to ask for support. It's so disgusting, pitiful to, to ask to be fully supported. But meanwhile, we all need that, you know, and, and that's where, mom, if you are listening, you also need support. Like that is the thing. We all need deep support and only... For me, the, 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 the big change has been when I not demand support, but command support. And that is a big difference. Demanding is from the neediness. Commanding is like we are all human beings. We are all much more alike than we are different. We all need support at one point or another. And... It is our birthright. It is our divine right to be supported by one another. I see that as my birthright to support. When, I, when somebody comes to me with full, honest, open desire for support, I cannot say no. It's like saying no to God. And when we step into that level of understanding, and that level of commanding support, that is where the healing comes from. And obviously, it's very important to understand the difference between commanding and demanding. Because commanding means I take full responsibility that I have created the situation, this disease, the situation for myself, but not out of stupidity or because I'm no good. I have created the situation for my growth, for my highest. So I take on one hand full responsibility, but I also realize I can't do it all by myself. I'm not meant to be doing it all by myself. And so I ask for support. I command support in a way that will best support and ensure my highest growth. And so when I stand in that commanding, and I open for the support to come in, in whatever shape or form it is, you know, it's whether it's in my business, I command a certain support, and then I open, and then I see what comes, and how does that feel, instead of um, needing, what's, what's the other word that I use, so it's, it's commanding versus, anyway, command versus need, um, that people, my partner is realizing how he needs to speak up with this lifestyle change. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's huge. I would almost say it is the biggest component of this lifestyle change. And that's why I love it so much. It's because it forces us to do the work on all levels and to truly become spiritual adults, to truly step into sovereignty. That people need to respect his food choices and he doesn't always have to accommodate. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I see that with my husband also, you know, when he travels for work and then sometimes he feels like he's at, at, a, at a dinner and maybe there's nothing else for him to eat and then he'll have something that doesn't really serve him instead of saying to, you know, the restaurant guy, well, actually, you know, can you take this and that and that from your various menu options and make one plate of this for me you know so it's it's really simple and yet we don't want to go and disturb we don't want to go and stand out but if we want to live and i feel everybody here that is part of this community you know we're doing this work because we want to live in our highest we want to live as the god and goddesses that we are in full humanity 
So that's where, you know, that balance comes in again. It's like we want to be in our, in our highest divinity and we want to live our deepest humanity. And that means speaking up. It means expanding possibility. And at the same time, we are creating a new world. And so by, demand, by commanding, we are creating a demand which hopefully, you know, sooner than later will result in restaurants serving living mucus-free food just as they serve ketogenic food, you know, and it is going to happen. Um, I noticed that, I noticed in my colonics, I wasn't assimilating the food too well. I need to learn to receive more and my stool told me that quite clearly yes isn't that amazing that so that that's where again you know it's and, and surely you know if you tell it to a doctor you know they would go like all righty you're you know losing your marbles but actually what i keep learning is that nothing is ever disconnected from anything and that everything matters and that is why once again as we become aware of this interconnectivity of everything that is when we can truly honor the need for us to remain consciously present all the time. Initially, that's difficult. And it's like, oh, when do I get a break from being so aware, from being so present? But then the more we do it, the more, and we, the more that we start seeing the results, the more we want to do it. So it's kind of like a self-feeding mechanism. Yes, being difficult, commanding changes things. Yeah, so it is. It's not about be, being difficult. It's simply honoring ourselves enough, you know. And that's where often, I mean, I sort of imagine myself, I project myself into the future, into the future Alex that I am becoming. And I go, well, what if I in the future, you know, am somebody you know like oprah i sort of use her because i love her we all do i think and so i imagine well what if this were oprah commanding you know a mucus free meal in a restaurant nobody would go like oh this one's being difficult it would be like oh sure it's oprah and so you know and then i go well why couldn't they say oh sure it's alex you know and and by alex it's like and it's maria emily rigo Nora. it's everybody like aren't we all deserving to be seen and and serviced in our highest expression but we only receive that when we stand in commanding that and it's like you know that's the big difference between commanding and demanding because commanding comes from a sense of um not even that i'm owed this but that this is my natural state. And obviously, on the other hand, that also entails serving the world with that same, um, with that same level of integrity, with that same level of, of um, what's the word? It's not authenticity, it's excellence. So it's about or as one of my teachers used to say, one of my earliest teachers used to say, become impeccably ruthless and ruthlessly impeccable. And that's been my mantra, you know, and I mean, I have ways to go with that, but I also realize actually, as I'm saying it is like, I'm sort of clapping at myself and going, wow, Alex, you actually have become better and better and better at becoming impeccably ruthless and ruthlessly impeccable because it's fairly easy to be impeccably ruthless that can also then just be the demanding part but becoming ruthlessly impeccable that is the commanding and to stand in that energy and to really cultivate that energy in everything that we do like an invitation yes uh commanding versus demanding seems very important it is it's crucial yes be more oprah <laughs> gonna use that commanding is like saying i'm vibrating at this high frequency come join me here absolutely yes isn't that beautiful 
And, and as, so as we do that, we then invite everybody. And of course, you know, inevitably that will be uncomfortable to some and some will go and say, Oh, you know, she's demanding or, um, you know, whatever projections will be brought onto us. But that is where we need to become okay with that. And to then also not take it personally and to even get to the point where we don't demonize the people that are projecting onto us, but to simply have compassion because it's part of the process. You know, I so often, uh, especially with my one-on-one -on -one clients, you know, I say like, use me, use me as your projection shield, you know, project all your shit onto me, like use me. Because that is how you do the work. You know, just as my husband and I use each other all the time. Because, like, who else do we have to do this work with? And that's where we can't do this kind of work on our own. And that is why we do need to ask for support. And it's so important to then invite people into our lives that can give us the support. And just to sort of round this off so that it doesn't become too long. Because another piece of this process is, so how do we, how do we go and ask for support in our journey? How do we invite people to hold space for us? And, you know, as I'm teaching in, in, an, in another group, in the liberation group, stepping into asking for support can look something as simple as this. And you may have a best friend or your partner, or even somebody maybe at your yoga studio or spiritual community, you know, and to go and say, you know what, I really would like to do some deeper spiritual work, some deeper emotional work. Would you like to be my partner in this? Would you like to be my mirror in this? And a starting point, is to simply get together once a week, once a month, whatever, and to create sacred space and to say, okay, we are, I'm going to give you different scenarios. You could do five minute eye gazing with a partner where you simply gaze into each other's eyes. And afterwards, you are simply going to talk one after the other, share what came up for you. So, for example, when you start doing this kind of exercise, especially with your romantic partner, initially, you know, we are going to project all kinds of things into the other person. So it can be that when I look into my husband's eyes, you know, I, they shapeshift. And so I may see ugliness. I may see his smallness. And so as I see that which is just a reflection of my own because otherwise I wouldn't see it. I feel all these feelings that this projection brings out, or maybe I feel his judgment for my say messiness. So I project, he doesn't need to say anything just by looking into his eyes. I may feel his judgment. And so after the exercise, I will say, as I was looking into your eyes, I felt judgment from you coming towards my messiness. And I feel like, you know, I've got it together on so many levels, but my cupboards are a mess. And I really have a lot of judgment towards that for myself. So do you see how then what we see in others, what the other evokes as a mirror is only ever our stuff. So that is where this practicing comes in with a partner. And it can be a romantic partner. It can be just a friend where we go and we practice the looking into the mirror, feeling what that brings up and sharing. And that little exercise, as simple as it seems, can really deepen a relationship and our ability to communicate our needs, to communicate our feelings and to just be okay with them. Instead of going to a story of like, oh, well, if I feel like this, it means that. No, it's simply, it's an arising. And just as I did not intend 
to feel that it was simply an arising and therefore I once again can trust that it is a divine arising it has a divine purpose so does does all of this make sense so another another option you know to do this kind of exercise and to get support from somebody could be instead of eye gazing if that becomes too uncomfortable or is too uncomfortable initially is to simply meet and maybe have like a five or 10 minute silent meditation, creating the sacred space where, you know, like let's say I'm doing this with a, with a girlfriend and I say, okay, we meet once a week, we meditate for 10 minutes and, and then we simply give each other 20 minutes to just speak and the other witnesses and then afterwards the other one shares and speaks and the other one witnesses and we leave it at that there is no need to you know fix or try and give advice or try and point things out it's we simply get together to witness each other to speak and to allow the process of witnessing and the process of allowing for the truth to just be, to just be and be shared and be witnessed and be heard to do its own thing. And it is amazing how deeply this will actually take us into a whole process, just this. So no fixing, no doing, no discussing, just the bring this information out and this will bring such deep revelations and and shifts within you and then obviously it will shift your way of relating and obviously you know there's other exercises that one, that one can do but these are just to begin with how do you begin holding space for another and it's actually so simple and what i realize more and more is that most people have no idea how to hold space for one another because we are in this constant um space of needing to fix so they're also oh, you know this person did this or said this or brought this to my table now i need to fix it and so often it's not about fixing it's just about hearing with a compassionate and open heart and when we have that energy everything changes so I'm going to I'm going to leave this this here and and leave a few minutes for you know whoever wants to ask some questions. Um but yeah so that's my invitation to really feel into changing our perception on the nature of disease and really finding the gifts that are in disease and to see where are the connections and into going into those connections and to come to a place of really asking, commanding for support and to owning the um, owning your right of asking for support, of receiving support, whatever that may look like, you know, and obviously keeping the awareness of like, okay, where am I going into that neediness, which is actually they're not wanting, it's disowning, it's not taking responsibility versus okay i take full responsibility but i also command support so yeah leaving leaving some time for questions um maria i'm interested in your understanding of anorexia we're having an intervention for a friend tomorrow so yeah, obviously anorexia is, you know, is a very complex, uh, I've worked with, with anorexia and um, with a beautiful, I mean, actually I'm going to try and have her come on for an interview because uh, what a wise girl. She came to me when she was 17, I think she's 19 now and just blossoming and doing so well. So with anorexia, very often there is deep, misunderstandings uh, and, and deep karmic stuff between you know mother and daughter sometimes mother and father but often it's mother and daughter um, it could be both parents so essentially there's deep issues between you know child and parent and and that needs to be looked at and really addressed and allowed to be expressed and then another aspect of anorexia obviously is is 
deep self-loathing, deep, deep, deep self-loathing and self-hatred and, and disowning. And, and it's this desire of wanting to remain small, wanting to remain unseen, wanting to disappear, which again is just a mirroring of disowning everything that we desire, disowning that which we are, because we judge, we have learned typically through the parents, you know, I mean, that's simply as it is, as much as parents then want to disown that, it's like, no, you played a role because you raised this child and unwillingly, unwillingly, you know, for me, it's not about blaming the parents, but it's about inviting parents to take responsibility and to go, okay, instead of then going into blaming it into, oh my goodness, how did I do this? No, take responsibility and see, see it as a gift see your child that brings this issue, even if it's an older child, to see this child as an invitation to your own growth because our children are, are always an invitation to our growth. You know, whatever they bring to us, as much as it triggers us and it will trigger us, it's always an invitation to growth. So when we change our perception when we make the paradigm shift from it's a disturbance, it's a hassle towards it's an invitation, then everything changes and then there's an opening for true healing. So that's where typically I see with anorexia, there is a deep need for family constellation work and for deep family work. And obviously for the person that is, is battling with anorexia is to really start deepening their understanding into all the areas that they are hiding from all the air, all the feelings that they are not wanting to feel and to give them enough support and space holding to feel all those feelings and to work with them. And in my experience also, that is where it does become, you know, if possible, important to do work with the sacred medicines because the sacred medicines are able to open up the person you know especially with anorexia anorexia is is in many ways more tricky than bulimia you know i mean they cut they're both very very tricky and i mean i had 20 years of bulimia so i know what i'm talking about but anorexia is almost a little bit more tricky and, and obviously also because of the low underweight. And so there's a lot of fragility there that really needs to be handled. And that is where I find the sacred medicines can really provide a big opening and a big understanding. So I hope that um, that helped a little. Uh, I'm experiencing hijacks where I binge eat something. I know I shouldn't. Chocolate bars mostly. Feels like I almost can't control it. Something takes over. How do I have more control? Okay, so there, um, you know, it's, it's again understanding. Uh, sorry, let me just quickly finish, uh, Rigo. Which sacred medicines are you talking about? So I'm talking about things like psilocybin, ayahuasca, San Pedro, so the shamanic medicines. Um, so Emily, back to, uh, you're welcome, uh, back to your question in regards to being hijacked. So there... It's important that instead of then spiraling out of control and just going into that hasty eating, which typically binge eating, it's like, you know, we, and that, I mean, that was me with bulimia. We just stuff our faces. We kind of go into this zombie out of mind space where we're just numb and we just act. And my first point of healing was to, first of all, stop judging it. And to, to, to really feel into the, the possibility and the reality is that, again, everything that you do has an intelligence. There is nothing that you do that you do because you're stupid or lazy or, you know, whatever, or deranged or whatever label you want to give yourself. Everything has an intelligence and a purpose. So if you stop judging the binging and you go, okay, I'm binging, I'm in this mode. What is this wanting to teach me? So with me, with bulimia, the first thing that I did is to stop my bulimic behavior, stop the judgment of it, and to then go, what does it want to teach me? And so the next episode that then came, 
instead of clonking out and disengaging and becoming the zombie and then just sort of going through the movement and then feeling the guilt, I stopped myself and I slowed down literally as if I was going through a time loop and I would slow myself right down and go, okay, we're going to stay present. We're still engaging in the behavior because we're trying to understand the behavior. We are studying ourselves. We are becoming consciously aware of ourselves. So what I would do is I would then slow down. I would say, okay, you're feeling the need to go into an, a, a binge episode. So let's do it slowly and let's do it beautifully with care. Sounds crazy, but it really works. And so I would maybe drive slowly to the shop, put on beautiful music, and then whenever I would feel my mind speeding up and disengaging from my feelings, I would say, no, 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 just stay present. Okay, so you're feeling anxiety. You're feeling like you just want to numb out. Okay, good. We're noticing. We're noticing. Good stuff. Cool. You know, I'll take you to the, to the, to the shop to go and take your binge. But well done, Alex. I would have these discussions with myself of I'm being present. I'm feeling into the feeling. And then I would see, okay, so now you're wanting to eat all this food. What are you actually wanting? I want nourishment, connection, soothing. Okay, that, that's good. At least we're realizing this is what we're looking for. You know? And then initially, I would still go through the motion of having the binge and having the purge. But eventually, once the more that I realized what I was actually looking for, you know, it's a little bit like, you you're looking for the perfect party dress and you're looking like crazy in this huge shop and then somebody taps you on the shoulder and goes there's no party dresses here they're over there you're going to stop looking here and you're going to go and look over there and so that is what i experienced is that the more conscious i became as to what i was truly looking for in my bulimic behavior and the amount of pain that I was hiding behind this behavior, I slowly was able to mother me, to take full responsibility and ownership, because that's very important. You know, nobody's going to do that for you. So you have to take full responsibility and ownership that you have resorted to a behavior that is not serving you, that is harming you, and to then mother yourself and go, okay come let's find a better way and it's humbling and it's difficult but it's also so empowering and so growing and sometimes we succeed and then we regress back to our old behavior you know that was for a while that um back and forth and then each time i would say okay you know what it's okay i will not feel any guilt no matter what, I'm not going there. I will not put more guilt, more suffering on top of this. And so I would really then watch myself and go, I'm not going to feel guilty, even though I went back, you know, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you. Yeah. Not disassociating. That is the biggest thing. You know, it's basically do no matter what, do not abandon yourself. And also eventually I had this realization. It's like, if I can't love myself through this, who will? You know, if not me, who? And that is what then eventually allowed me to really stay with myself and to just love myself. And that was the first step. And, and initially it seemed so kind of humbling and so like, oh my goodness. Like it, it, I felt like I'm in kindergarten. You know, I have to now just really stay with me and, and love myself in this little pathetic way. But you know what? The reality is most adults have no idea of what it means to truly self-love. And, and that's where I always go, you know, the people like us, the people with disorders, the people with disease, we are the lucky ones. And I truly feel that because we have an opportunity to truly learn, to tru truly transform, to truly find self-love. And let me tell you something, once you do, and once you start really feeling into how good it feels to command support, to command love, 
There is no stopping you. And that's kind of where I feel at now. If you would have seen how I was just still two years ago, I was a different person. You know, I was not commanding love to the degree that I do now. I was not commanding success and everything that I command now, you know, and, and I'm still, it's more and more and more and more and more. So it's amazing how in a very short amount of time, we can radically transform ourselves and our lives. Rigo says, that is what I thought. Thank you. I recently took part in three ceremonies, peyote, ayahuasca last week, and I've been off off and on Masterfast system and can't seem to get emotional roller coaster under control as need to stay functional as I had two jobs. One just, one just ended. Any advice on how to decalcify the pineal gland? Just ordered borax, will order colloidal silver and iodine and other suggestions. I feel I hit a plateau with Masterfast, can't handle the emotional craziness. Yeah, see, that is where it's very important to pace ourselves you know, because it's also like in, in the sacred medicine world, so many people, they go ceremony after ceremony after ceremony, you know, they just hammer it all in. And this kind of work, I mean, we, we are delicate, beautiful flowers. We are nature and we work in cycles. And so it is oftentimes two steps forward and then one back and three steps forward and one back and four forward and three back. And the key to mastering our lives, our emotions, the key to basically continuously grow into our highest and to spiral upward is not about blasting through it. It's about, it's how well do you dance the steps forward and backwards? You know, it's like, can you be okay? Can you be in joy and in equanimity and in appreciation and in gratitude when you do feel yourself regressing, when you do feel yourself out of control. And by not buying into the, oh, I'm getting it wrong, but rather it's all right. Every single step of the way is correct because you're spiraling upwards. And as you spiral upwards, you will inevitably revisit some of your old shit, but you revisit it from a higher perspective. And I truly believe that that will never end because in my 20 year of, you know, deep spiritual journeying and deep personal work, and especially I would say in the last 12 years, you know, I've had many moments in between where I thought, Ooh, I think I got it. I think I'm done. And every single time that I thought that I got a whack from the universe and it was like, really? I think not until your last breath, there is work. Do you get it? And once it was like, okay, I get it. I think I get it. And just surrendering to that, to that knowing that we are ever spiraling upwards. Absolutely. We are not regressing. We're continuously spiraling upwards, but in the spiraling upwards, we are also revisiting old stuff from a higher and higher perspective. And especially when we do work with the sacred medicines, it is so, so important to do the integration work. And that is where personally I find having a really strong, and it took me many years to get to a daily strong spiritual practice. And off and on, I had a spiritual practice, but it was kind of like two weeks on, six weeks off, you know, two days on, five days off. And it's only again in the last two years where I have realized that I need as much as I want to be so free and so irreverent and so, you know, in my own story I need the anchoring of a strong daily practice. I personally have found it in the Kundalini yoga tradition simply because it answers all my needs of meditation, chanting, physical movement, which moves the lymphatic system. So I kind of feel like I get it all there, but it can be anything, but it needs to be a practice 
that basically challenges you every single day. And that's the other reason why I so love Kundalini Yoga, because you have to stay present. You know, there's practices that you can do and kind of bypass very silently. Whereas in Kundalini Yoga, there is no bypassing. Because if you do the practice, it will challenge you every single day anew. And that is what you need to basically be every single day, be humbled anew and to realize, ah, I've got more work. Ah, bless me, bless the universe, there's more work. And when we stay in that motion of gratitude, of humility, of understanding for pure, the necessity of pure presence, then the work just starts, you know, then it's like, that's why chop wood, carry water, chop wood, carry water instead of, and yes, in between we have these big explosive openings and movements and, and um, spiraling upward and insights and breakthroughs. But ultimately all these breakthroughs need to be integrated in the day to day. So I hope that that helps you in terms of also, you know, borax, iodine, colloidal silver, Oh, cod liver. Mm, the pineal gland, you know, it's, it's, a, it's there also. It's rather the drop, the constant drop on the stone instead of these forceful openings. And, you know, it's, it's trusting that it's just a gentle undoing, a gentle undoing. And so it's the consistency. And that's where also sometimes with Master Fast, you know, I mean, I love Master Fast system, but I'm also very aware that I can only do so much. And for everyone, that will be slightly different. But I'm aware I need to pace myself with Master Fast. I need to do a Master Fast, and then I need longer periods of integration. And it, I need to come to that period where okay, I could actually just cruise like this forever, which is kind of, that's where I'm at now. You know, typically I do a master fast. After the master fast, I feel a little bit like, oh, the show, okay, I need to find my grounding again. And there's a moment of difficulty. And obviously that is where the big work is. And then I start finding a groove and then maybe I lose it again. And then I find it. And then eventually I find like that kick link and it's like, okay, I'm at a new groove, which is where I'm at now. And it's been smooth sailing for many months. And only now I feel like, okay, now I'm ready to go and do another master fast system because I'm really solid where I am at now. And if I wouldn't be feeling so solid, I would not go into another master fast. Whereas I feel a lot of people, you know, are constantly unstabilizing themselves. So they never really reach a, a, a stability, a solidity, which is, it's just one level, you know, it's not that you have to stay there, but like find solidity, then push forward and then be in the destabilization, find new stability, then push forward. And with the pineal gland, the most important thing really is it's meditation, it's sun gazing, being out in the sunshine. Um, I would also recommend turpentine protocol, which I find very powerful. And, um, you know, you could use things like cracked pine pollen, which again is really good, but um, turpentine, you know, is perfect. And, and then just as you work on cleansing the whole body, the pineal gland will open, you know, and it's not just going to like open and then there it is, it's done. It's a progression. It takes time. So, yeah, welcome, um, Amrita. I know you just joined us just now. We've been going for a while, but you can, you can rewatch uh, the, the, the replay. Uh, Rigo says, turpentine, and what else did you mention? I did not catch it. Uh, pine pollen. So it's, it's cracked. Um, so you want, you want the cell walls cracked open of the pine pollen. So pine pollen which you can find online. It's, it's literally the pollen of pine trees. And that's also just very good for opening the pineal gland and the adrenals and so forth. So it's, it's really good stuff to take off and on. Um, 
Yeah, and then obviously, you know, herbal tinctures, which is from the master fast system. I mean, the whole adrenal, um, pituitary, parathyroid, you know, all of that works in conjunction. And as our adrenal system heals and our endocrine system heals and a nervous system repairs, then also the pineal gland will open. So I thank you so much for joining me. And um, yeah, I think it, it, uh, it was a, a good conversation. And I, I thank you for your comments and all of that and feedback. And we'll put it out there so that everybody else can listen to this. Thank you and sending you all my love and care. Phew. <sighs>